Hi. Uh, this is Janet Fitch, and uh, if it is noon on Wednesday, uh, it is Writing Wednesday, where I answer your writing questions. Um, and today will be a great day to, if you do have questions, please, uh, uh, we'll share them and we'll see if we can answer your questions. You can leave them in the comments. And if you want to, um, if you want to have a Writing Wednesday designed around your question, you can uh, send it to me on my website. There's a contact form, janetfitchwrites.com. And uh, we can spend a whole session on your question. So uh, go ahead and do that. Um, it is, uh, let's see, we're on our um, run up to uh, the Oscars. So that's always a, a fun thing to do. Um, hey, Malika. And uh, also, I should say that the Community of Writers Summer Writing Conference. Uh, is going to be in person this year uh, up in uh, uh, up in the Sierras, uh, where I teach every other year. And there's going to be in person this year, so we're all going to go up uh, for writing summer camp uh, in July. And there's ten more days to apply, uh, so that's communityofwriters.org, and. Um, uh, it's a formative experience. I mean, I, I uh, participated there um, in 1995, uh, and uh, it was uh, just an amazing experience. I met my editor up there. I've been teaching up there for 20-something um, years, uh, and have met a lot of people who have become writers themselves. And so they've gone from being students to being colleagues. Um, so that's always a, that's always a really um, a gratifying experience for me. You know, I'd say I, I have like three or four students who have books coming out right now. So uh, that's very exciting. Uh, Debbie Lascar's book, uh, Circa is coming out, or has just come out. Uh, uh, Olivia Clare um, Friedman, uh, Here Lies, that's coming out. Um, they're just popping. Everybody is uh, getting a lot of work done. Hi, Roberta. Good to see you. Um, so it, at the Community of Writers, it's wonderful. You have um, a different leader for your workshop every day. So the workshop stays the same. You'll be with the same people, but uh, the instructor changes. So you can see how different people teach um, and you can decide, well, when I'm teaching, I'm going to do this and I'm not going to do that. And uh, uh, I learned a lot about teaching because when you do teach, you don't get to see how other people do it. So it's a super valuable experience for that alone. Uh, there's also editors, agents, different people are leading your workshop. So you can see what their take is, how they look at a manuscript is different. Uh, you learn a lot from that. Uh, and um, you also get a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with somebody that you want to work with. Uh, usually they'll entertain your first choice or maybe second choice. Um, and you get to have somebody who sits down with you uh, and uh, tells you what they're thinking, you know, what your issues are, what they can help you with. Um, there's a lot of times where, you know, you've been writing on your own, you have no idea. Um, I mean, a lot of us weren't in programs. Uh, and, uh, to you know, it's invaluable to get to get a, uh, you know, an experienced writer, editor, uh, agents sometimes, uh, to say, you know, well, is this working or isn't it? <laughs> you know, is, is this ready or isn't it? Hi, Aaron. Speaking of uh, a student who is successfully publishing, Aaron has, uh, has a, a new kind of a humorous romance coming out, um, for better or worse. Uh, so it's good to see you here. And, um, uh, at uh, so the community of writers, uh, there's also panels, there's lectures, there's camaraderie, 
there's readings. Uh, it's a really full experience. Uh, you don't sleep a lot, especially if you like to party. Uh, the The poets don't party. They 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 generate work uh, while they're uh, up there. So they're just working their butts off. Whereas the fiction writers, you bring work that you've already done, so you have a little more time to um, to make friends and uh, have a good time hike around. It's beautiful. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to being back up there. I haven't been, you know, they, they haven't had an in-person for a couple of years. So this is going to be really great. Anyway, so you still have time. You have 10 days to apply for that. Um, and they do have, oh, and Sin Katie, there's somebody I met at the Community of Writers. Um, and fiction writers bring wine. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. And not only. <laughs> um so it is a treat. Uh, it is really worth it. And there are scholarships available. Um, they're getting better funding these days. So um, uh, definitely worth, uh, worth checking out. Um, so today I am happy to answer any questions you put in the comments. I will address them, but I do have questions that have been um, sent to me uh, via the interwebs. Um, and uh, I thought I would, one of them was uh, particularly um, exciting, so I thought I would try this. Uh, so, so he asks, um, what are common traps for aspiring writers? And does a big ego help or hurt writers? Well, I'll tell you, when I, um, <laughs> when I was in, uh, my writing teacher, Kate Braverman, uh, taught a workshop at, at uh, uh, UCLA. And uh, I worked, did a week weekend with her. And uh, after this was over, she called me because uh, I was very interested in working with her. And she called me and she said that she'd invited me to join her private workshop. And... Uh, she said she run, ran two workshops. She said in the morning they uh, bring Danish. The morning group brings their Danish. And the afternoon group uh, brings, uh, they bring their egos. And I was going to be in the afternoon group. <laughs> so this question of the writer's ego is really interesting. Now, People have published out of both. People published out of both of those workshops, the morning and the afternoon. Um, but the afternoon workshop, uh, there are people that you would recognize who'd come through that workshop. Um, and uh, ego is essential because writing is is an assertion of self. It's saying, I, I have something to say here. I want you to walk, you know, Didion said, you know, that fiction is an aggressive act. And it's funny because if you look at writers, you think the least aggressive people in the world, right? You know, we're like <laughs> trying to talk ourselves out of a fight always. But... You have to have a sense that you have something to say and you're making people stop and you're ma you're making people stop and listen to what you have to say. And the power of writing is your way of grabbing somebody's attention and saying you must listen to this. You must hear what I'm saying. And um all the things we do to keep a reader reading, I mean, they we're keeping them from going off and doing their laundry or going to the movies or uh, 80 godzillion other things that um, they could be doing. Writing, to write is to command the reader, you must listen to this. You must keep going. You must find out what I have to tell you. Um, and it is aggressive. And if you don't have any ego, then you start asking yourself, why, 
why would anybody listen to me? Why should they listen to me? I don't have anything to say, you know. Um, people, writers need that ego because the world will tell you over and over that they don't give a crap what you have to say. They don't give a crap, you know, what is in your heart, in your soul, what you want to share. Um, and having it, you know, a little more than a little scoop of ego of, you know, you're going to care about this. I'm going to make you care about this. Um, makes it's writing would be you're, you, you'd be, it would be very difficult for a writer without ego to make the, have the force uh, to apply to reality, to make that connection, to make that communication. Um, and it doesn't mean you have to be an aggressive or egotistical person. You know, many writers are very quiet, very shy, but they can be, but internally, they're, those quiet, shy people can be very um, serious and very um, aggressive as to what they want to put out there in the world. You also have to have a good, good sized ego to bear the rejection. You know, there's going to be my, <laughs> my husband who has gotten more short stories published. Hi, Krista has had more, um, rejection. He has had more short stories published, uh, in, he's been writing short stories for maybe 10 years now. And he has, you know, probably 20 published short stories by now. Um, and he, he, he uses the online submittables that many of you use uh, to um, get his stories out there. He calls it the rejectionizer. It's nothing but rejection. Writing is nothing but rejection. I mean, the proportion of rejection to acceptance is, is horrendous in this, especially as you're getting started and making a name for yourself. Um, without ego, you're never going to be able to get past that Mississippi River of rejection and skepticism and like, you know, you prove, you know, prove what you have going for yourself. Um, so ego is important. It's important, you know, to be, if you look at taxi driver and you see that, you know, Travis Bickle, that whole routine of, you know, I'm walking here, I'm walking here. Um, you talking to me, you know, <laughs> you need that aggression. You need that bit of Razzo Rizzo, you know, uh, midnight cowboy, like I'm walking here, you know, and you pound the, the, the hood of the car that's, uh, inching forward. Uh, it's like, I'm walking here. You, ha you need that. You need that. Uh, and you need a good scoop of it. Now, at times that might actually become problematic. It's a double, you know, like all other virtues and vices, they are uh, the same, you know, that's the same coin, you know, your virtue is your vice and vice versa. Um, ego can be a problem too. And uh, so you need it, but you also need to know when to rein it in. Um, and most of all, um, ego is a problem, becomes a problem with some people never send work out because the ego is so inflated that they think they can't bear somebody saying, mm, not for us, does not meet our needs at this time, you know. They don't want to be challenged by the world. Uh, so it's the ego needs to be solid, not just large. Um, but also ego can 
um, it can be too thick a protection against hearing what other people think or say, you know, if you really don't believe that you care a th damn about what anybody says, it's hard to improve as a writer because you're, you're deflecting not only the, um, the disheartening opinion of reality out there, but you're also deflecting necessary information. You know, you're deflecting vital information. Um, you are rejecting helpful people, um, people who are reaching out to you, but because you're in such a defended position that you, 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 you treat it like an attack instead of somebody actually trying to help you develop as a writer. So you need that big ego, but at some point you also need to be able to quiet it down and listen to what people are saying people are telling you. Um, for me, that was the harder one. Um, it's why to have a teacher that, like I had a teacher that I just would have followed, followed off a cliff. And luckily she didn't leave me off a cliff. Um, <laughs> luckily, I mean, that was just pure luck. <laughs> um, but I admired her so much that I was willing to listen to what she had to say. And in workshop, other people would give their crit. Um, and when, when she would say things like, are you hearing this? <laughs> you know, I had, to, you had to come off of your, uh, you had to, that ego had to, to pull in a little bit so that you could hear you need the sturdiness of ego, but you also need to develop the ability to rein it in, to hear something valuable. It doesn't shake you to the core, you know, because you're going to do it. You're going to do what you're going to do, regardless of what anybody says. But there are people who are going to help you if you can quiet yourself down enough to hear and also to notice. So it doesn't mean taking on everything anybody else says. Um, you know, somebody says, you know, you know, you, you should give this up. you you know, you just suck. Well, the big ego is like, you know, who are you? Why don't you go take a, you know, go jump in the lake or something less, less polite. Um, but also to notice when somebody is telling you something that, really needs addressing and not reject everything. I mean, God, I've had, uh, I hate to say it, I've had uh, students in my um, graduate program who just could not hear uh, any kind of critique, you know, whether from others or from me, you know. They were so sure that they were getting it right. But what happens is with people like that who can't let the inf any information in is they keep making the same mistakes. They, they cannot, they just don't develop beyond where they were when they came in. So why the hell are they in a class at all? You know, they can't take on the information because ego won't let them. So it's... Um, You know, sometimes it's like wrestling wild animals, the, the, the afternoon group in the Kate Braverman uh, class was, um, you know, it was like a feeding time at the zoo. I mean, we all were really very egotistical and yet we admired her and we admired each other. And it's tough if, you know, if you're a strong person, it's tough to be told that something was over the top or, you know, 
you took the easy route, you went the snarky way instead of really uh, feeling down into the depths of your work. Or you busted your butt on it and somebody says, what did you fax that in? Which, ah, it hurts and you want to hurt them too. Um, but that has nothing to do with the work. Uh, so I think that having a big ego helps the writer because you wouldn't be able to do it at all without your ego uh, wanting to make an impact on the world, wanting to make an impact on other people. You need that ego. So first you need the ego. Uh, so that helps. But then as you're learning, as you're growing, ego can get in your way and become the real stumbling block. So it's just always taking your own temperature, you know, being sure, but not too sure, you know, always being open to, to ideas, but not so open that you're just blowing in the wind. So it's a dance, but yes, we do need the big egos and writers will, mm, I'd say 90% of writers, 80, are, have a really big ego. And then maybe 20% are um, um, more on the trans, transparent, translucent, uh, Buddhistic uh, types. Yeah, it's a tightrope. Uh, Here's another question. Any So I'm watching your question. So Linda says, are you coming to the book festival in April at USC? Uh, I might come, you know, for a day and watch the writers, but I'm not, I'm not involved this, this time. They do a lot of, um, they do a lot of, um, there are a lot of panels and often when you don't have a book, you lead a panel. But um, this time I'm just, you know, between books and, uh, uh, you know, it's a really fun day. It's a really fun, I used to go and just sometimes my ego, uh, in the early days, I mean, sometimes my ego was just so, uh, a throb with envy, uh, at the book festival that I had trouble, like even going to some of the panels I just couldn't stand it that these people were doing so well and I still didn't have a book. Um, you know, writing is weird. And the book fest brings it out uh, in writers, the, uh, the uh, comp, we're a little on the competitive side. You know, we, we enjoy each other's, we enjoy other writers' good work, you know, but then there's also personal ego that just is there and you're you just have to know it's there you know it's just like having a big dog that you have to walk over every time you need to go to the bathroom it's like oh there he is again that big freaking dog yep yep it's there but it you know it certainly doesn't keep you from admiring uh the work of other people you know i remember being at uh, up at the community of writers when i was a participant long ago and uh, Amy Tan was going to speak at a luncheon that they had for everybody. And um, I remember she started, it was like the Joy Luck Club had just broken. And uh, uh, she had been a participant at the Community of Writers as well. Uh, so she was going to speak and everybody was just like talking, like, like ignoring her because the egos were just like, oh God, you know, she was such a roaring success that everybody was, you know, people were really, um, you know, they were gonna show they were unimpressed. But she started speaking, she started, she read some and she was speaking and she was, the writing was so beautiful. And what she said was so interesting that people just it got completely, within five minutes, everybody was over their little, ego thing and able to hear and take in. That was funny. It, it, Lisa says that's really sad. It was really funny. It was just, you know, it was kind of a sibling thing. Um, uh, yeah, it was, that was very, that was a really funny time. By the end, I mean, you know, everybody was just worshiping her. So it was, it was 
life, you know, these things happen. So here's another question I have. If, um, I got this one. Can I go to therapy in character <laughs> for research for a work of fiction? To get the best results, should I tell the therapist that I'm in character or keep it secret? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. Can I go to therapy in character for research for work of fiction? Should I tell the therapist that I'm in character or keep it secret? I love that. I think you can. I mean, it's a, therapy is pretty expensive. <laughs> <laughs> to be doing that and you would have to be an act you know quite a qual you know a notable actor to be able to do it in character but I certainly have brought up questions of character uh, when I was in therapy I would ask my therapist I said you have this character and she's blah, 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 you know I don't know what to think about you know how she would and that therapist it was just like it was my dime you know she was happy to talk about my character you know certainly I'd talked about my struggles with the book um and uh she was happy to think through the character with me you know it was I didn't do it a lot because it was really expensive <laughs> but uh yeah I don't see why you couldn't why you couldn't do it I wouldn't do it unless you know you want to do it as a piece of performance art you know, to, to go to therapy in character. Um, it just seems like a lot of unnecessary work rather than just telling the therapist that you're working on this character and, did, you know, you, you thinking of them doing blah, 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 blah. Does that sound about right? Yeah, but no, I, I think it's a great idea. Why not? Um, and, uh, Linda said it sounded disrespectful. Oh, the Amy Tan thing. Uh, <laughs> it was just one of those moments. People are people, you know, and, uh, and there are these odd corners of emotion that are part of life. And that's the kind of thing that goes into our work is recognition of how people really are. And it could be silly. It can be you know, counterproductive, uh, it can be slightly disrespectful, but for a reason, and the reason is more interesting. Uh, how, how people react to somebody else's success is, it's interesting. Uh, here's one, here's a question I got. Um, which less intimidating word, this is Brian, uh, Brian asks, which Less intimidating word can one call a novel, especially for one who dreams of writing, but whose mere thought of writing a novel sounds too daunting a task. That's interesting. Um, a lot of writers just say the thing, this thing I'm writing. <laughs> this thing, this thing I'm writing, I don't know what it is. So you're allowed to say that. You don't have to declare it. To be a novel um, until you get at least a first draft. Uh, you, it usually, it often will start as a short story that just keeps moving. It keeps moving. That's usually when the writer goes, I don't want to call it a novel. That's too intimidating. So you could just call it a story, the story I'm working on that's getting larger by the minute. Um, uh, so, you know, you always, you write a scene and you write another scene and you write another scene. And that's basically, that's what a novel is, is one scene after another. So uh, you can call it, I'm writing this scene or I'm writing this thing. That's what many people do. Um, if writing a novel is too daunting a task, which it is. So Lisa says, in Intriguing question about going to therapy in character. Do we as writers want to create a character or become a character? I think that's very interesting. I think you, um, I think that 
we create a character. I think becoming a character, when I was younger, I wanted to be like a character in a novel. I wanted to have this adventurous life and I wanted to, you know, live out this romantic dream. But I found when I was doing that, that I wasn't writing. <laughs> I was too busy living and being, you know, having this dramatic life. And I didn't, I didn't have the calm and the kind of emotional balance to, to write. Um, so for me, it was like, do you want to be a character in a novel or do you want to write a novel with characters in it? Um, and I decided I wanted to be a writer. Um, I think other professions, I think actors in other, in other, um, art forms, it's harder to make that distinction. I think actors in a way become, because they have to use the physicality, they, they do become the character or they are in danger, not in danger, but you know, that's one way of working is to become the character and kind of feel your way in that way by, you know, having a sandwich as your character and going out. And it's, that's an interesting thing to do if you're having trouble contacting your characters is to walk around as them. I did that as Marina in Marina M and uh, Chimes. I, when I went to Russia, I walked around as my character and s tried to see the world through her eyes, see the city, the landscape through, through her eyes. Um, walking around as your character is, is very interesting. Um, you don't have to dress up or anything. You can just do it internally. Uh, but some people, I mean, I, I remember getting a wig, a Marina wig. You know, she had bobbed hair because it was revolutionary, 1917, 1918, and women were bobbing their hair, you know, to be a mod, modern women. Uh, so I must say I did wear, uh, I had a wig. It looked terrible on me but uh, a Marina wig and uh, wore that. And in internal, in interiors, you know, of definitely walking around, saying the lines, how, how do they, what do they do with their hands? You know, how do they, what are their gestures? And um, that's the kind of thing you get wonderfully from uh, being the character, acting. Uh, taking an acting class is a really good thing for a writer. Actors are wonderful writers because they do know how to inhabit a character that way. Um, a fame, Lisa says, a famous poet I know calls it an N O V N N O V N O V E L, the novel that you don't want to admit you're writing, um, you know. But ego is wouldn't ask that question. You know, I'm afraid of it. What a you know, what's a less intimidating word? I mean, an ego somebody with an ego says they're writing a novel before they're writing a novel when they're just starting, when they just have like three pages of a short story. Um, so, uh, you know, I, 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 I certainly, you know, you could call it an investigation or an exploration. It's an, it's an experiment. What else can I, uh, do for you? for writing Wednesday. Uh, any other questions I, that you have? Um, I'm doing a lot of thinking right now about point of view. I'm getting a point of view class together for the 13th to the 15th of May. Uh, it hasn't opened yet. I don't, I don't have all my materials in, but because you're my writing Wednesday crew, uh, I should tell you that that's coming up. Um, and reading, I'm reading uh, a favorite book. Actually, I'm listening on tape to, uh, or they don't say that, it's streaming. 
I'm listening to it in audio, um, of uh, Robert Stone's Dog Soldiers. And he does some really interesting point of view work, uh, moving between the author's narrative, a point of view character, and then actually a little bit of omniscience, just a little bit. And it's very effective. I'm, I'm, so I'm gleaning material for point of, for that point of view class I'll be teaching uh, in May. Uh, let's see, is there anything, any other questions that I have not, have not addressed? Let's see. What do I have here? So, yeah, we'll be talking about, like, point of view is where you put the camera. So we'll talk about first person, second person, third person, um, the granularity of first person. You can get really the sense of being that, the texture of that personality versus the ability to zoom in and zoom out when the point of view is in third is very much outside of the character. Um, you have a lot more choices for your uh, where you put the camera. Hi, Zunaid. Uh, any questions? I'm, I'm uh, waiting for uh, anything to surface. I um talking about the point of view class that I'm going to be teaching at the Community of Writers at May 13th to 15th. Um, I Right now I'm reading, I just finished The Book of Laughter and Forgetting by Milos Kundera, Kundera and that's an interesting book. That's a, a real book. He's a real um, writer of ideas. He's uh, uh Every, you know, I always say, you know, take the next step, move to a bigger idea. You know, don't just ha eat a sandwich and think of eating a sandwich. You know, you can go anywhere. You can think about anything. Um, and he asks bigger questions. Every page, every character um, has some larger thought about life. Um and how what it is to be a human and how things are set up and how things are structured political thoughts and uh philosophical thoughts and you know there's like some iffy sexual thoughts uh you know uh, i am somebody who can read somebody i don't agree with and go oh there's that stuff again okay well that's his thing you know and i hope he gets over it like pretty soon um, so Tony, hi, Tony. Um, oh, there's one up above. Uh, um, Tony, um, is asks, would love my insight on writing revelation scenes. Revelation scenes. You mean like plot revelations? Um, you know, revealing that my sister is my mother and my mother is my sister. That kind of scene? Probably. Um, how you, how you uh, set up, it depends on how every scene should have a revelation of some sort, right? Or how you're going to get a change. Every scene has to, has to have a change. Uh, otherwise, you don't need it. Um, so the change will be the at least one revelation. Um, you have to build to it. You have to put enough pressure on the scene that the understanding will pop. Without any pressure... We don't really believe, oh yeah, how did they figure that out? Uh, it's not like a poem where they just 
you know, suddenly the revelation is right there in a line. In fiction, you have to build to it. So there's pressure. You know, I realized he was never going to sign for that loan. You know, you have to build where I'm hopeful that something's going to happen. I'm picturing how it's going to play out. And then there's like all this crap starts happening. And this is not what I wanted. I'm, I keep trying to get him to, to get this topic around to the loan again. And, but he's getting angry and angrier instead of, you know, following my logic. And then um, at a certain point, my character would go, you know, he, he's never going to sign for that. And then it's like, okay, well, who cares about anything else or what you think? And then the scene will turn. Um, let's see. Um, so that's, that's uh, handling, those revelations are the movement of the book. They are the movement of the scenes. Re I realized something that wasn't what I came in here to do or not what I thought it was, or he's not who I thought he was. Um, but you have to make them work for it. Revelations don't come out of the sky. You know, you are, your character has to earn them. Um, Let's see. Um, okay, we have a couple questions now. Hey, um, let's see. So Malika says, "Do you have suggestions of lists of words to use for binders? Sense words, taste words." My suggestion is that you have to work to accumulate. You have to write those lists. Those lists are through exercises. You have to accumulate your own vocabulary lists um, of sense words. You have to touch things, smell things, say, say you need texture words. You have to handle objects and ask yourself, what does that feel like? You know, what are texture words? You know, uh, rough, smooth, cold, hot, dry, wet, you know, and then handle materials and ask yourself, what are the sense, what are the textures I'm getting off of this? Hard, heavy, warm from handling. Um, smooth, hollow. You have to get these words and then put them in the notebook. You, it's not going to be the same. Watching somebody do reps is not going to be the same as you lifting weights and doing the reps yourself. You're not going to gain power in your work by adopting a list of somebody else. You know, it just, it's like watching somebody else play baseball, you know you're not going to get the same experience and muscle memory and all that uh, unless you're throwing the ball over and over and over. Um, let's see. Um, so Lisa says it would be amazing to do a Writing Wednesday on endings. Endings are very interesting. And, you know, how do you feel complete with something. Many people say, you know, endings, a good ending opens things up again. You know, it, sh it, it shuts down and then it gives you a look ahead um, to the future, just a glimpse, and then you're out of there. Um, Malika says, do you use Excel or Word for the lists you print out for your binders? I use uh, Word. Um, I just, I have a file in my uh, computer called Notebooks. And when interesting things happen, say I'll have a, a file that's um, encounters. Uh, and I'll just put 
any kind of weird encounter that happens, I'll write it up and put it in that. And then when I have a page, a full page of it, I'll print it out and put it, put it in a binder. Um, So I'm, oh, Tony is writing the end of uh, Protagonist Learns Some Major Family Secrets. Um, the revelation itself is not the, um, is not the, should not be the end. There should be the work, how that, revelation is going to settle into the life of the protagonist will be your ending. Um, that the revelation is more like the climax and then there is what follows the climax of resolution of some sort. And so the rev the resolution is your ending rather than the, the revelation. Um, there sh should be some aftermath um, using foreshadowing for revelation hmm trying to even think about how that would how that would go foreshadowing is an interesting it has to be you have to keep foreshadowing pretty subtle uh, otherwise, it, it makes my eyes water. I mean, there are certain writers that the, the foreshadowing is so heavy-handed. It just, you know, it, it makes me cringe in an otherwise good book. It ruins a good book for me. What he didn't know was, or so-and-so was, you know, going to turn over her world. And it's just like, can you not do that? <laughs> uh Let's see. Um, uh, Zunaid says, recently the fireside chat on Writing Wednesday covered authentic voice. Yeah, the inner speaking voice helps her find the music. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, mm, for me, voice is so... It's all about the character. It's why I can write poetry from a character's point of view, but not from my own point of view, because the voice is so their voice, even if it's in third person, it's gotta be them. And it's always gonna differ from my own voice. Um, generally, I, I write in the character's voice. Um, or am influenced more by by their speaking voice and their the way they the way they think the way they handle language. Um, so Steve DeGroote says I've been trying to develop a rhythm between humor and despair. Any thoughts? Yeah, that's a. That that is, um, there's a humor and despair generally. Um, humor plus despair equals um, gallows humor. What do you call gallows humor? Um, if you read, say, um, Sergei Devlatov, the suitcase. It's a very funny book, but it it's funny he gets himself in situations that are just, he just can't see his way to avoid them because of the way society is set up. You know, your friend uh, wants you to do something, you, you do it, it, even though you can see it's going to be a disaster from the get-go. It's like my brother, you know, has this idea, and here I am, you know, unloading, you know, polyester finish socks in the middle of the night uh, and I know it's not going to go well but you know I'm kind of screwed and I've got to do it and it's funny and it's just you know it is despair distilled into humor uh, so I, I definitely suggest The Suitcase by Dovlatov um, 
Um, yeah, the third person narration, Zunaid says, the third person narration could be closer to the fictional character's voice rather than the author's. Yeah, I tend not to intervene, but there can be third person where the author's voice is, um, there's a bleed between the author and the character, but in third, you can pull back further and the author can use their own voice in describing the character and describing the situation. Um, I always try to have them pretty close together. Um, let's see, there was one below that. Um, so Shauna says, any suggestions for a good book that uses first person point of view and some other narrative device, diary letters, to lay down historical foundation of a story. Hmm. You know, I'm thinking of books like The Poisonwood Bible, I believe, is all first person. And it does, does it use diaries, etc.? I think so. There's also a book called Red Water by um, Judith Freeman. It's been a while, but that's about the founding of Mormon Utah. And it's from the points of view of four of the 19 wives of uh, John Lee, who was one of the original founding Mormon um, pioneers. Um, I think those are first person as well. With Combined with letters and diaries, there's got to be plenty of them. I, I'm not, if anybody, here we go. Well, Zunaid is saying, how about Shelley's Frankenstein? Uh, for that narrative device. There's letters in that, right? Um, I think, um, I, I'll think about, I'll think about that and see if I can uh, come up with some others and I'll put it in comments. Uh, do you have some good newer YA historical fiction recommendations? Tony asks. Um, good YA historical fiction recommendations. Oh my God, there's got to be a ton of them right now. Um, but I'm not reading a lot of YA, so I would have to think about that one a lot. Um, but yeah, I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are. Um, I'm sure there's some wonderful YA historical fiction right now. Um, YA is just booming with really intelligent work, um, and you should be able to find that. Um, so Shona says the Poisonwood Bible comes to mind. I have a child protagonist. Yeah, the, the, um, protagonist, the point of view characters in the Poisonwood Bible are all children, uh, or young, young women, um. But the scope of my story is large. Um, yeah, that's going to be harder to do with a first person. Uh, uh, a third lets you pull out a little bit more. Um, obviously, when I say best of all, present company excluded. Let's see. Best of all. Uh, let's see what that was. Oh, for narrative device, meaning the... the um, uh, Frankenstein. Uh, the Quiet American, MJ says, oh yeah, first person POV in letters. There you go. And that is a brilliant book. Um, for anybody who likes Graham Greene, um, we always have these wonderful arguments about which is the best Graham Greene. And I, I have argued many different ones, usually the one I just finished. Uh, but 
I think over time I've come around just thinking that The Quiet American is his best novel. Um, just, just brilliant. Um, so anyway, it is uh, getting on time, and uh, I want to thank you guys for joining me for um, for Writing Wednesday. Check out uh, the Community of Writers Summer um, Conference. Uh, you have 10 days left. Yeah, the Power of the Glory is pretty great. Um, and that's uh, the, uh, the Graham Greene question. <laughs> um so you have 10 days for the community of writers to apply still for this summer. And uh, I'm going to be doing my weekend workshop uh, the May 13th, 14th, and 15th. So, so keep that handy. Well, thank you for joining me. And uh, we'll see you next week for Writing Wednesday.